Hey everyone, Urban Fish Keeper here. Hope you're all doing well and you've had a good week. Um, it's that time of the year where, you know, we start spending more time with family and friends and getting ready for Christmas. Uh, for those of you that, that celebrate Christmas. Um, so, for me personally, there's a lot more family commitments. And I'll try and do as many videos as I can during this, this last part of the year, wherever possible. But... Um, it's, it's becoming a bit of a challenge. Uh, my grandchildren have just arrived from Sydney, so that's awesome, and I really want to spend time with my sons and with my grandkids. All right, so today's video, um, I wasn't too sure how I was going to do this one or how I was going to put it together, but it's, it's something that happens to me quite often. Um, and when I say quite often, over many years, it's happened on, on, on occasions. It's... It's the, it's the whole thing of one chance breeding, and I call it one chance breeding because you only get one go at it. And if you blow that, that's it, it's done, you don't get another chance, and you may have to wait months, sometimes years, before you get the opportunity to do that kind of breeding again. Now, for those of you that are breeding or trying to breed things, you'll experience this in your breeding time without a doubt. Now, for me, what one chance breeding is all about is it's about being as best prepared as I can to make the best of what I've got. So what do I mean by that is, a lot of the time we will we'll go into a, a fish store, we'll go to a mate's house who's breeding fish, or you buy a couple of fish from a, from a store that are, are, are juvenile, you can't sex them, but you really want to breed those fish. Um, and I have that happening to me you know, where I really want to breed something and I haven't bred it before and it's, it's something different for me, or I'm determined to breed a particular line and I only get that one chance. And that one chance is normally because, hey, I could only get one pair. Out of the juvenile group that I grew up, I only end up with one pair. Or I get them and they're actually not doing that great. And I'm willing to take the gamble. Now, that's just recently happened to me and that's why I thought I'd share some of this with you and how I prepare for one chance breeding. So let's go back probably six weeks or so. Um, I was down at, at a pet store and in one of their aquariums they had some peacock gudgeons. Now these little gudgeons were really tiny. Peacock gudgeons generally are tiny fish but these were really tiny so juvenile. And we were unable to, between myself and the owner, we were unable to determine the sex of these gudgeons. And therefore, I couldn't get a pair. They were reasonably, well, they were reasonably high priced, which means I also couldn't buy, I think there were eight of them or six of them available. Um, and I bought four of them and took the gamble on four. Now, I got them back, popped them in one of these 20s, um, what I immediately did is, because I really wanted to breed them and I've never bred them before, what I did immediately did is I made sure that it was a dark tank, there was wood in it, um, the water uh, had tannins in it, and not necessary to change the effect of the water, but to make it a, a dark aquarium. Let me, sorry, let me just go back one step. I first put them in the aquarium on the end, the one that's got a pair of killies in at the moment. And... Within two days, I could see that they were stressed and they were not doing well in that tank. And you'll get that. You'll put fish in a particular tank, they just won't like it. You put them in the tank next to it and they thrive. And this was the case here with these gudgeons. I put them in this tank on the end and they just weren't doing well. And within two days, I could see that they were stressed. They weren't feeding well. They just weren't doing well. I then moved them to the tank next to it. A lot of wood, um, cover, dark water and immediately within an hour or so they were feeding really well and they were settled down. So that was the first challenge is to settle down the fish. And it doesn't matter what fish you pick up that you go, oh, I'm only going to get one chance because I haven't seen these around for ages and if I blow this one, um, you know, I'm not going to get a chance to do this again. And with one chance breeding, all you really want to try and achieve is you want to you get a spawn out of, out of a pair, you want to look after the eggs, you want to then feed those fry and get them to a stage that they're reasonably stable and strong, move them into something that you can grow them, and then you've got a group to start breeding from. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, in the, in the case of the gudgeons, I had the four 
um, started feeding them really well to get them growing so that we could start getting some uh, that I could start seeing the sexes and within a couple of days after that two of them were really not doing well um, and it was another day or so and I lost two now I could have lost two because they were they weren't in good condition um, the tank conditions that they were in first and then the second tank just didn't work well for them the stress the shock the move um, it could have been that the other two that were left could possibly have been bullying them without me seeing it. So there's a lot of factors there that I'm not too sure why I lost the two, but I lost two. I was then left with two, which I then made the assumption is probably a pair. I fed them and I started seeing behavior between the two that indicated to me that it's a pair. And I started seeing some of the markings that I expected to see on the male and the female that indicate it was a pair. So we were doing good at this stage. Now, a few, go, a few days forward again, the, um, what I thought was the female disappeared and I couldn't see her at all. Now, because there's wood and everything else in there and I also put in uh, some clay pots, um, you know, on top of each other so it made uh, small caves to go in because they like to breed upside down or lay the eggs on the, on the roof of, the, uh, of a, a round tube or clay or whatever, but they like it tiny. Um, the female disappeared, I couldn't see it. So I left that for a, for a good few days. Um, and then I caught a glimpse of the female and she had what looked like an internal abscess on her side, which indicated to me it's more than likely that she was not gonna last very long either. At that stage, you then need to make a call. If you can see the eggs and it's this, this fish that you're trying to breed that you've never bred before, you only have one pair, you then need to make a call. If you can see the eggs, my view is you pull the eggs at that stage and you take your chances from there forward. If you can't see the eggs, you need to make a call based on the behavior of the fish that determines whether you then determine whether you think they've laid or they've spawned or not. In my case, I thought that they had spawned and I made the call to, to open up the wood and have a look to see if there was anything. When I did that, there was eggs and there were little fry that were starting to not, they weren't free, they were just dangling. You could see the little tails moving. I then pulled, uh, I pulled those and moved those. Two days later, that female passed away and that was the end of it. I now have no option and there's no more of them available where I bought the last lot so when I will get peacock gudgeons again I don't know but what that meant is I now had a group of probably 25 fry and I had one chance to try and raise these and get it right so that I could get some together that I can then breed and as you have a look at this video footage you see this little container that's got the fry in you see the little piece of clay in there from the clay pot um, that's what they were attached to. There's a little air stone and there's some um, plants in there and there's some java moss as well. Now, I rely heavily on when I'm pulling eggs or pulling fry or doing any of that kind of thing to try and maximize the result out of a particular spawn, I always try and depend on plants as best I can with the exception of the discus. And if you look back at my discus videos, you'll see the methods I use there for artificially rearing. You know, it's about water quality, moving the water through, the regular feeding, it's got nothing to do with plants. But with the other things, you know, um, and the same applies to the rams, I use the same, very similar method for the rams is what I do for the discus. But when it comes to some of the other stuff, the killies, um, and, and various killies, um, and the gudgeons, I like to use a method by which, because temperature is not a factor, um, I prefer to contain them in the smallest possible container, still maintain the water quality. And the reason I go for a small container, especially with something like the gudgeons, is they are, they are really tiny when they are when they, um, free swimming. They're not quite better tiny. So they don't need infusoria for that first few days, but microworm is about the biggest they're going to take in the beginning. So you would go microworm, 
and then to Brian Shrimp. And Brian Shrimp only really came into the equation. And the video that you've just seen of them, that's two weeks in. So, so Brian Shrimp has only really come into the equation two weeks in. The next challenge you'll have is once you've moved the eggs uh, or you've moved the wrigglers or you've even siphoned out the fry and you've put them in a separate container, is if you've moved the eggs, the first challenge is not to get fungus on that eggs. So you need to use something like meth blue. And if you look at my previous videos, you'll see I, I reference meth blue quite often for, for making sure that there's no fungus. Um, or Blue Planet, there's, blue, there's a Blue Planet product as well, which I've referenced before, which prevents any fungus in the water. So that's the first thing you want to do, is you want to prevent any fungus attaching to those eggs or any of the eggs that are, that are infertile getting fungus and then spreading to everything else. So first, first thing you want to do is protect those eggs. So you get them in, you put in your meth blue, you put in an air stone because you need a bit of circulation and it doesn't have to run hard. You know, a little couple of bubbles just in front of the eggs, just to create some circulation of moving the water past the eggs is all you need. At that stage, when you've got the meth blue in there, you, don't, you probably don't need to add plants to it. What I do is I use a turkey baster and I replace water in that container with a turkey baster every day. So, you know, three siphons out with a turkey baster, three siphons back in. And let me just grab it. I'll show you the one that I use. Okay. So this is the turkey base that I use. Okay. I siphon out three, you know, three siphons. And then I put in um, three, <coughs> excuse me, three fresh. And again, I use the aged water that's been standing in my room for a period of time. So that's your first challenge. If you've got eggs, you need to make sure the eggs are good and you can get them to free swimming. If you're moving fry, your challenge then is initially is, right, I need to, one is water quality. So in that case, if I'm using a small container, if the container is big enough that it can take one of the tiny sponge filters like you've seen me use on the Better Rack 2.0, I would put one of those in. If, if not, I would have an air stone in there and I would make sure that I replace that water on a regular basis, as in daily, again, using the same method, but trying not to suck up any of the fry. The other thing is I definitely would add in plants at that stage to help with the water. Now, any of, and, and when it comes to, you've got the fry, um, you've had the eggs, the eggs are gone to fry. Now the challenge comes in is you need to feed them something that is appropriate for their size, but you also need to make a call on when do you move them to the next stage of growth. If you move them too early, they don't get to the food and you lose a big quantity. If you move them too late, you can't keep up with the water quality and you lose them as well. And a lot of that comes with experience. But when you're doing one chance breeding, it's very difficult because you only get that one chance and you, you really have to try and get in touch with the fish that you're breeding as best you can. And a lot of that comes, unfortunately, with experience. But, you know, you look at water quality, you look, just how does the water look? Um, do the other fish, the fry darting around and swimming around, when you put a little bit of food in, are they eating well? Yes, they're doing well. Um, you know, or they're just lying at the bottom and they're not looking great. It's now time to move. So, the phases that I go through is, and the other thing is, yeah, before I show you some containers, the other thing is that when you're getting ready to do this, you've got this pair, you don't know if you'll be able to ever get them again, you want to breed them, whatever they are, do a bit of research to understand how do they spawn their water conditions, etc., which is normal, and you try and give them that to get them into that spawn. But then in the background, make sure that you've got the first food available. So in the case of the gudgeons, and, and, and as you all know, I always have micro worm running in, in, in the fish room. So make sure you've got microworm cultures running, right? And you're ready to go. The other thing is 99% of the time, they'll go from whatever you're doing, whichever fish, they'll go from your microworm or your, you know, you might even go infusoria, vinegar eel, microworm, brine shrimp, depending on the size. So if it's something like the betters, that's normally the channel that I take. Make sure that you've got brine shrimp eggs available and ready to go. And 
even if you just have the branch of the water running with the salt in and the salt mix just running one side ready all you need to do then is add the eggs and 24 to 48 hours later you'll have your branch shrimp. so newly hatched branch shrimp. so have that ready from a container point of view use whatever you like um, it's it's based on your space um, it's based on what's available in your country I use these kind of containers from my local Kmart I use the little these that I've got the the microworm in I use that and the video that you saw which is these little food lunch food containers the video that, that I inserted showing the the gudgeon fry that's one of those containers once you've then decided and remember don't go too big because you want to make sure that they have uh, availability to the food that you put in and they don't have to go searching across a large space or area to get the food the food is always there around them the other thing that I will say when you when you're doing this kind of when you get this one chance and, and you're trying to raise something and and get a batch so that you can breed what you also want to make sure of is that yes sure the water quality that you've got the food and everything else in the container size but don't overfeed. I would rather say underfeed slightly. And when I feed brine shrimp to those gudgeons, I've got a pipette that I use and I siphon the brine shrimp out, you know, because I rinse it in fresh water and then I siphon it out. And it's maybe four or five drops of brine shrimp and that's it. Um, you know, if you're seeing a big clump of brine shrimp sitting in the corner after 15, 20 minutes, you've probably put in too much. And the microworm, You've seen me for how I feed that. It's on a little paintbrush. I, I rub it off the sides and I then dip it in the water. Once they get to a size that they're now free swimming, they're eating brine shrimp and you're feeling, okay, it's time now to move them to the next. In my case, I make use of these kind of containers. This is a Zeiss. It fits on the inside of an aquarium. It's got an airline tube. It then pushes water and you can regulate the water. It's got a stainless steel mesh so the water goes through. When I get to this stage, same thing. It's not a massive container, but it's getting good water quality because it's part of the whole water system that it's fitting in. I also add some floating plants in here and then feed as per normal and go on to that. Now, in the initial part, if you have challenges as in not only water quality, but you need to heat up that little container is a couple of methods you can either take another container like another aquarium you drop the water really low you put a heater in the bottom and then you then take these containers and you place it in that water with the airline tube and your air stone in there the other method is to use this one which you guys would have seen me use on this aquarium quite often um, I've used that method for the rams, I've used that method for the discus and when I'm artificially rearing discus you, will, you would have seen that this container just fits in the top of that it then has a sponge filter that feeds water into this container which flows out on the side but it means the temperature in here remains the same I also use this method if I want to put this container in there um, you know in there with water in that aquarium and then I use one of the sponge filters these ones here and that then feeds the water directly into this container now the containers that I use are the round ones the same ones that I use for the discus which have got holes drilled in the side so the water then flows into the container, uh, into whatever you've got the fry in, out of that container, into this container, and then back into the main aquarium. In so doing, using that kind of method, you're getting the water quality, you're getting a little bit of movement, the sponge filters, you can regulate the flow, you can have it really slow. And if you look at my discus artificial rearing, that method there, you'll see exactly what I mean and what I did there. The containers that I used, the drill holes, etc. And then it's getting the advantage of the temperature and the combined filtration of the aquarium that it's in. Once you get to that stage where you've got them into something like a Zeiss, 
um, where they're now starting to feed well. You're moving on maybe to some powdered foods, not any brine shrimp. Then you're well on your way. And then it's just a question of raising them as you would normally raise your fish. And, you know, and then make a call when they get to a certain size that you then move them across to you know, one of the aquariums. In my case, I would just I move them across to a 20 um, and we'll raise them further in a 20. But even at this stage with those peacock gudgeons that you, in the, the inserted video, you know, there's still no guarantees. You know, I could leave them in there just a couple of days too long because I'm you know, not too sure. And they, you know, I could lose a fair amount of them. I could move them in to the Zeiss container just too early, stresses them out, they don't get to the food, and that's it, I lose them. So it's finding that happy balance. But I thought I'd just share some of these experiences with you because these it's one of those things that I've experienced a few times, quite a few times, where I find something in a pet store, or I get hold of a little group of fish and I go, like the peacock gudgeons, I have never bred them before. I really want to breed them. I get one chance at this because there's probably not that, I can't find any others around, I couldn't find any adults. Um, and now it's just raising that, that group of, there's probably 20 there, uh, so that I can try and get some pairs out of that and then I could breed more if I wanted to. Anyway guys, I just wanted to share that with you, share some of that experience with you. Um, next weekend is the Christmas weekend, so not too sure if I'll be doing any videos next weekend. Um, if I do, I'll speak to you then. If I don't, have an awesome Christmas if you celebrate Christmas. Enjoy the time with your family. Enjoy the time with your friends. If you're traveling over this time, please travel safe. Um, look after yourselves. Um, you know, now with border restrictions being eased and so forth, great that we can see family again. Have a good week. Um, look after yourselves. Till the next video, Urban Fish Keeper out.